Brief History of Lincoln Cathedrals, Chapter House Roof Hi! We are going to look at the history of Lincoln Cathedral Chapter House Roof. This view of the chapter house by Holler is about the sum total of our knowledge of the medieval roof. As you can see, the roof's lead is in a herringbone fashion, but the roof is what we would recognize today. The present roof of the chapter house is of two periods. The first roof built by James Essex in 1761-3 was unusual because it was of pine timber. The second built, which restored the roof to a full pyramidal form in 1801 architect unknown, as the citizens of Lincoln were unhappy about such breaks with tradition, as the Western Spires incident had demonstrated in 1726, and so the roof was raised to look like its medieval original in 1801. James Essex is in his survey of September, 1761 he wrote, The chapter house roof is very bad in both timber and lead work and unless secured soon will do great injury to the vaulting but as the whole must be stripped, I think it would be better to take down the roof and lay it flatter which will answer the purpose fully as well as save timber and lead. This was a starting point for his designs. The dome-shaped profile, or something similar, is there from the beginning and although the earliest drawing has the roof supported on the central column all subsequent drawings truss it up so that in cross-section it has the form of an arch or in three dimensions, a dome which at first springs from a false hammer beam arrangement with wall posts based on corbels and is next supported on queen post trusses surmounted by low-pitched king post trusses. Finally, the internal framing of the structure is resolved into five interlocking triangular trusses at the core with shallow pitched king post trusses on their sides thereby converting the triangular shape into a dome by a method commonly used in the 18th century. There is quite extensive documentary evidence for Essex's work at Lincoln. Fabric accounts survive, although interspersed with all the other routine expenses of the upkeep of the cathedral. Almost the first entry in the accounts relating to the chapter house is on 30th. April 1762, carriage of the chapter house model from Cambridge, the great advantage of a model, which was quite a common aid to architectural design at this period, is that the structure can be viewed in three dimensions, like cat. In fact, one of Essex's first pieces of work, 1750, following the death of his father, a carpenter, was the construction of the mathematical bridge at Queen's College, Cambridge using a model based upon designs by William Etheridge. Both bridge and model still survive and have a system of trusses forming an arch structure reminiscent of Essex's early designs for the chapter house roof. The lower part of the, the roof as we can see it looks like it is has overwhelming complexity and, although entirely of softwood assembled by ironwork and forelock bolts, is the product of a master. Had better timber been available, it would have been assured of considerable durability. The pine used, however, is not capable of enduring the stresses to which it is subjected, particularly where it forms the radiating tie beams that are much cut about to form their peripheral joints with the wall plates. Why James Essex should have persisted in the use of forelock bolts, long after threaded bolts with nuts had become available, is difficult to determine, but an aim for low cost could be the answer, since in terms of efficiency there may be little difference. The basic unit of the design, visible when viewed on any one of its diameters, is of two superimposed queen post assemblies set inside a pitched roof having a king post. Of this, the principal rafters are doubled and a king post truss with raking struts is mounted on outer rafter, producing the two pitches of the gambrel roof. While this is a combination of two known principles the construction of the essential ring beam that secures the inner ends of the ten radiating ties may be the architect's invention, and is so ingenious as to merit illustration. The plan attempts to explain the method of its assembly, and the perspective detail shows the assembly of the ties and the ten-pointed star formed by the beams. Words will no further clarify these drawings, which will be found intelligible if protractively studied. The decagonal tie beam so formed has proved until this time to be adequately strong, although of pine wood, and is subjected to both radial extension and shearing stress. The wall plates have also proved adequate despite the fact that earlier examples in lesser structures have been made in oak, but the tie beams, where they cross the crossings of those plates, are likely to fail, mainly owing to the inadequacy of pine for such purposes. But the best way to understand the construction of the roof is to sit back and watch it unfold and enjoy. 